I want a more proactive Interior Department. I also want an Interior Department that, very frankly, cleans up its act. It's been one of the most troubled departments in recent years. From close links with disgraced lobbyist Jack Abramoff, to a sex, drugs, and influence peddling scandal at the department's minerals management service between oil company executives and department officials. The pervasive culture of exclusivity, exempt from the rules that govern all employees of the federal government. It's a lot of, a lot of work ahead of us. You might think such a monumental job could be discouraging, but not yet, it seems, for Interior Secretary Ken Salazar. He's a cheerleader, and he loves it. You can see it in his face, you can see it in the enthusiasm and the energy that he has. The department's authority ranges from the Parks Department, to the Bureau of Land Management, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It is a highly contentious and litigious portfolio that oversees 20% of the landmass of the United States. I do it your head, okay, ready? Secretary Salazar's focus is on two tasks, cleaning up after past scandals, but also implementing his own policies such as putting climate change at the center of the agency's agenda. We're doing both. Um, you know, we are cleaning up the mess and have cleaned up a lot of the mess. But progress has been gradual. All right. Secretary Salazar recently moved to shut down the scandal-plagued royalty and kind program at the Minerals Management Service. It was the latest in a series of reversals of Bush-era decisions. He's trying to root out an entrenched culture at his department. There's a couple of visitors passes <laughs> from Earth Day. See, I was there on Earth Day. Okay. Ethan Manuel is a lobbyist at the Sierra Club. His focus is on public lands issues, and he's worked with Interior for over 20 years. He was invited to the department only once during the eight years of the Bush administration. But now we're there all the time. I mean, we've been there uh, almost a ridiculous amount of times. They're excited for the access and the focus on renewable energy. But even if they enjoy more face time, they recognize that it isn't a complete policy reversal. So far, the secretary's record has been moderate, even conservative. One of his most controversial decisions has been allowing the leasing of some environmentally sensitive public lands to oil companies. Recently, he announced 38 more leases. Another point of controversy was taking the gray wolf off the endangered species list. It allowed them to be hunted for the first time in 30 years. Both have been the subject of lawsuits, and many environmental groups are disappointed, some saying that this new secretary's path has been indistinguishable on some matters from that of the Bush administration. Both decisions, not surprisingly, are very attuned to the political realities of the West. Welcome to the West, where we're building the new democratic majority. I have the calluses on my hands uh, that will never go away. He's descended from five generations of Colorado ranchers, and his views put him very much in the tradition of Western Democrats in Washington. Hey, how many of you ride a horse? How many of you ride a horse? He takes a more utilitarian view of land use decisions than groups like the Sierra Club do. It does influence my thinking about uh, the outdoors of America and how we take care of our land and our water and our wildlife. On nearly every issue, his job is a balancing act. Few other cabinet officers get pulled in quite so many different directions. But it's a job that Mr. Salazar was chosen especially for. My dear friend from the Senate, Senator Ken Salazar. He was picked over a number of more progressive choices, and his close relationship with his new boss is part of the reason. They came to the Senate together in 2005. I remember uh, many of the first times when we were at the White House or when we were together on the floor of the U.S. Senate. We learned together. And their relationship may help Mr. Salazar on his number one Please, agenda seat. item. And developing uh, the kind of energy independence that is so vital to our economy. Uh, this is a signature issue of our time. Uh, it is one that we are committed to resolve with uh, all the earnestness uh, of the issue. On a recent trip to Montana, ostensibly to talk about river preservation, the energy debate and climate change in particular were hard to escape. This place named Glacier National Park, by the year 2020, according to projections, we will have no more glaciers here at Glacier National Park. Right now, both of these gone. large glaciers are completely gone. Dan Fagri works for Interior and studies the effects of climate change on the park. He's seen the glaciers recede firsthand, and it's only gotten worse. Some of the glaciers that I thought would last a little longer probably aren't going to. The question is, 
What can Secretary Salazar do about it, here in Glacier National Park or anywhere else? The glaciers are melting, and there isn't much he can do about it other than try to adjust. So we're working on what they call the adaptation agenda. You know, it's a fancy word, in my view, for uh, the reality of change, that we have to develop uh, a response uh, to those uh, real changes that we're seeing because our climate of the planet is changing. Back in Washington, he's proven himself an important and determined advocate for the administration's energy agenda, in part because of a soft touch with his former colleagues. But he's been less successful at changing actual votes. Congressman Nick Rahal is an important figure on environmental issues, but he voted no on the climate change bill in June. He wasn't successful in every case, mine being one, nor his brother being another. John Salazar, a congressman from Colorado, voted no as well. Are you continuing to work on him to try and maybe bring him around when that <laughs> legislation comes back after conference? Uh, you know, he's my brother, and uh, so I don't lobby him. But it is a difficult issue. Even though he's Secretary of the Interior, uh, members of Congress are going to look back home first. Secretary Salazar's political background has led to a department with a flair for public relations, using the imagery of the West. Nice to see you. Nice bolo tie. Oh, thank you, sir. Brought you a nice hat. Oh, thank you so much. But when he travels West, he often leaves the cowboy hat back in Washington. He's still more of a politician than a bureaucrat. So between Colorado and Montana, which one's the more beautiful one? Well, right now, I would say Montana. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I know, it's I know which closer. side my bread is buttered on. <laughs> The question is whether the new feelings Mr. Salazar has ushered in will translate into concrete progress. The Interior Department has had problems as far back as the Teapot Dome bribery scandal in the 1920s. One of today's challenges can be found in what was missing from Mr. Salazar's office when he moved in last January. When I came on board, there was not even email capability within the Secretary's office itself, no computer in here. And Part of that had to do with uh, the very extensive uh, litigation that has gone on and that has uh, basically held the department hostage. A computer's in there now, although Mr. Salazar, as head of the department, is still named in multiple federal lawsuits. He acknowledges he has yet to fully grasp the reins of the sprawling department, but he remains consistently upbeat. The reform agenda is something that is a continued one. You don't just finish it one day and it's over and you move on.